Good morning. I'm really excited to be here uh, to talk to you about how you, you can make the Angular team work for you. Um, and I'm going to do that by providing you some context and background, um, and also some insight into how the Angular team actually works. Once you understand how something works, you can be more effective in engaging with it. And um, I'm also going to offer you some specific strategies on things you can do to actually make the Angular team, as well as the community, uh, work for you and maximize the work that they actually do for you. So by way of a quick introduction, I'm Manu Murthy. Uh, that's my Twitter handle up there. Um, I'm a senior technical program manager. I work on the Angular team at Google. I've been with Google since October 2017. And prior to that, uh, I worked for Apple, Hewlett Packard, managed some large programs for them uh, at the point, based in Sunnyvale, California. And uh, I hail from Chennai originally. All right, so let's start with some context and history on why this is important. So I'm going to start off today by looking back three years to 2016. This was a big celebration we had in Mountain View uh, following the first stable release of Angular, Angular version 2. Three and a half years have passed since then. A lot of things have changed, uh, not just with Angular, but with the entire ecosystem. But first, I want to anchor in on something that really has not changed. And that is the value system of Angular. We want Angular developers to love building applications that users love to use. And we want them to do it in a community where everybody feels welcome. That is one of the main reasons why I chose to join the Angular team, is because of the value system the Angular team upholds. The team truly cares about building an inclusive environment uh, regardless of where somebody comes from or who they are. And this is really what Angular is all about. Um, here's a quick summary of the evolution of releases uh, for Angular. Uh, we've had seven major releases, as you can see, since 2016. Um, as Rob mentioned, we just released Angular version 9 with Ivy as the rendering pipeline earlier this month. And the team has been pretty good about following a six-month release cadence. So we launch a major release every six months. We've been pretty good doing that. Uh, two major releases every year. The team also puts in a lot of thought and effort to making sure the update experience between you know, moving, moving across these releases is also seamless for users. And that is ng-update. Angular is also a complete framework. Um, use cases required to build beautiful, responsive applications have been considered and thought through. Uh, whether you're looking at doing animations or server-side rendering or uh, internationalization for native language experiences, you can take advantage of these time-tested patterns that Angular has to offer. Angular everywhere. So in the community, I see such a wide array uh, of applications, you know, of Angular applications. I cannot think of a domain where Angular isn't actually used. Healthcare, travel, retail, um, financial services, you name it. Angular, isn't it? And I'm always on the lookout for Angular applications when I, uh, when I peek around on the internet. And I actually came across a couple of interesting uh, observations. So the Indian Railway is actually the uh, e-ticket uh, booking for the Indian Railway's website uses Angular. So does the income tax department's e-filing website also uses Angular. And it's really nice to see that these high volume mission critical websites actually use Angular as the platform of choice. There's several other websites. I don't have an exhaustive list. These are just you know, websites that I uh, happen to run into uh, that I thought were interesting. We serve our users by embracing and embodying their needs. Um, and one of the best ways we can do that is to appreciate and respect the diversity that exists amongst us. And India seems to be doing a particularly, particularly good job at this. There are more women in India using Angular than men and women combined in the rest of the world, in most countries at least. And I think that is no small feat. All right, uh, switching gears a little bit, let's talk about Angular within Google. Angular is very popular within Google as well. Um, some of Google's biggest applications, such as the Google Cloud Platform's console, is actually written using Angular. 
And we've had tremendous growth within Angular. As you can see, in late 2018, we had 600 plus projects using Angular. Late 2019, 1,500 plus projects using Angular. So with great success also comes great responsibility. And these were some of the points Rob was alluding to. So we make sure we go through great lengths to ensure that any change we push out is thoroughly tested and, we, and the impact is well understood. All right, I want to provide a peek into how the Angular team within Google is organized. Um, we, we, have, we have various sub-teams. So the three main sub-teams that we have are the vertical blocks that you see that we have framework, and uh, Kara Erickson is the technical lead. We have the tooling team. Uh, we are in the process of hiring a technical lead. And we have components, which is uh, led by Jeremy Elborn. So these are the three main functional teams or, or, or sub-teams within Angular. And then we have horizontal or common denominator functions, such as dev infrastructure um, that deals with our continuous build environment. You know, uh, uh, anything to do with builds, developer productivity are all handled by this horizontal dev infra. We have the documentation uh, sub-team, which is uh, headed by uh, Dave Shavitz. Dave is a new addition to the Angular team. He's been there for a couple of months. And uh, developer relations is headed by Steven Fluen and uh, Rob Menko are part of the DevRel uh, group within Angular. That's kind of a nutshell how we are organized. I just thought it, it would be useful to uh, provide this insight into how we are organized as a team. Um, I also consider myself very fortunate to work with some amazing people, both within the Angular team as well as the community outside. Uh, and these are just some random pictures that I captured in my two plus years uh, with, with these amazing people. The Angular team, we work very hard and we also play very hard. So the point I'm really trying to make is that managing an open source project is hard. Managing a popular, high velocity open source project such as Angular is even harder, right? And there are hundreds of people across the ecosystem and Angular um, helping to build and make changes uh, to evolve the platform. The purpose of my talk is really to show you how you can get these people to work for you and how you can maximize the work that the Angular team as well as these people can do for you. All right, strategy number one, better bugs. So how can you create compelling and actionable bug reports? Let's start off with some statistics first. So in 2018, 79% of open issues were closed. In 2019, we actually did worse. So we're down about 6% or so. We, uh, we were at 73% of open issues that were closed. And that's partly due to the fact that we haven't been able to maximize our process efficiency to keep up with the ongoing demand and growth that Angular has shown. We can certainly do better. And how can we do that? So when you've identified an issue, the first thing to do is to ascertain whether it is actually a bug, as opposed to a user error or a misunderstanding or an environmental issue. If you're unsure, there are some really nice resources such as Getter, 18,000 plus members, uh, Stack Overflow. There are various channels where you can actually clarify your understanding and ask the question before you actually log a bug report. Also, you can search on GitHub to see if the issue has actually been reported. Um, by default, GitHub only searches for the open issues, so you may want to expand your, the scope of your search to include closed issues as well. Even with closed issues, you may find valuable workarounds, comments, and uh, things that may benefit the problem you're trying to solve. If an issue already exists, please do not duplicate it. Instead, find the source issue if one is open and add any pertinent information and any additional information that will help us to triage and fix the issue. If you do not find an open issue or if the issue is completely different, uh, the, the ones you have found is actually a different scope, then it makes sense for you to proceed further. The third thing to do before you actually file a bug report is to create a minimal viable reproduction of the issue. This is extremely important because it helps crystallize your thought process and your approach before you actually write down a bug report. Um, we have a Stack Blitz template that we link to from our issue creation template that you can actually use. And the template is very simple. It's a single component uh, with inlined markup, no fancy files. And the reason we keep it simple is we want a minimum viable reproduction. What I mean by that is every single line of code you submit in your reproduction 
will need to be executed to reproduce the issue. Right? I've seen issues where somebody has submitted 2,500 lines of code, and think about thousands of people doing that. Right? It's not a scalable and sustainable model. Now again, this template should work for majority of users. If you have a CLI issue or something else that requires anything additional, sure, feel free to go ahead and create it, but this should work for most of the uh, issues we're trying to solve. The other thing to do before you actually file a bug report, um, is I actually talked about this. Let's go here. Okay, now with version nine for IV, there's also some tools we have enabled that you can take advantage of. So for example, uh, we have a ng global object that you can use to further troubleshoot your problem before you log a bug report. So let me g actually give you an example of what we can do. So what I've tried to do here is actually uh, just implement a material slider, and I will show you how to manipulate that using the ng global object. So I have an import here, uh, and you can see all the other imports. I will not walk through all that. Here's my template, math slider, pretty simple. Uh, starting range, ending range, how I want to step through the values, and I'm initializing it with the value of 100, which is, goes to the maximum, right? should look something like this on your screen. OK, so far? Now comes the interesting uh, pieces. So you can actually get a handle to this component using $0, because I've actually uh, selected the DOM element uh, previously. And if I do an ng get component $0, I actually get a handle to the material slider, and I'm assigning it to math slider. Okay? Step number two, math slider dot value equals 50, assigning a value of 50 versus 100 that we had before. And then ng apply changes with the math slider as the argument will force change detection. And so what that does is your slider should actually look like this with the value of 50. So the point here is that you can use these tools to do a lot of troubleshooting and due diligence before you log a bug report, and so please use it. Uh, these debugging APIs that we have surfaced through IV will actually enable more sophisticated debugging tools that we will be building in the future, so stay tuned for those as well. Um, Rob touched on this. The short of it is that you, know, you can also, we have much more useful stack traces than we had before with the view engine. So previously, the stack trace with the view engine was linking to view engine internals, and so it was pretty much uh, inactionable, right? So you could not take any action on it, and it was rather confusing. So now you actually have a very clear stack trace with template functions and the actual expression that caused the error. Again, use these tools to troubleshoot your problem before you log a bug report. Um, the other thing V9 has also enabled is much better error messages, much more readable, color-coded. We also have error codes, and so you can expect to see that we document these things on Angular I.O. with respect to error codes, makes for much easier searching experience and lots of other things. And that's it. If you've completed these steps, you've actually been a good citizen, and you're ready to submit an actionable bug and compelling bug report that will get looked at by the team. And this will also help us you know, process and triage the issues much more efficiently, and it will help us scale better overall. Um, this is the process that the Angular team goes through once the bugs have been submitted. We actually go through a triage process where we assign a component, and we assess the severity. Again, this is basically a tool for us to determine how we prioritize and tackle these bugs. Strategy number two. What have you tried? So the second strategy might actually seem very obvious, but it happens almost on a daily basis. And I see questions on Gitter or uh, you know, Stack Overflow. Almost see this every day. And so this is another area where we as a community can make a significant difference and help ourselves scale better. So basically, if you're about to ask a question anywhere, in a forum, an email, in person, anywhere, be prepared to answer and demonstrate the fact that you have done your due diligence and you have tried certain things before you're actually reaching out to the other person, expecting them to answer. So I was on the fence about putting this as an example because it is a non-angular example, uh, but I think it helps drive home a point. So this person has written, can we establish HTTP connection application? If so, I need the code. I checked this particular you know, uh, uh, class and I cannot integrate that code. I want to display an image from a website. Can anybody please provide me the code? So what is wrong with that? The person wants a solution fully formed, ready to go, right? Rather than asking for an example or sample code or clarifying you know, what they're trying to do, right? 
And honestly, this is a motivation killer. There's lots of good people answering questions on forums and stuff. And when they see behaviors like this, this is a motivation killer for people who are trying to genuinely help other people. And so this is an area where we as a community can make another significant difference. So willingness, the desire to learn are the true qualifications. And next time you want to ask a question, please do your due diligence, you know, do your homework, and try this approach out and see you know, what difference it makes. You may be surprised with the results. There's actually a really good article that I highly recommend you read by Matt Jemel that talks about this very topic. And he goes into a lot more depth than I can possibly cover in half hour. Uh, you don't need to write this down. I'll be sharing the slides on Twitter so you can get the URL from there. Strategy number three. How can we do better with pull requests? I think everybody knows what a pull request is. If you don't, it's a Git term. Uh, when someone makes a copy of your code, they make changes and modifications to it, usually through a fork and a branch, and then they want you to pull those changes into your repository. right? So in other words, um, they, they are essentially asking you to pull those changes in. That's what a pull request is. Stats. In 2018, about 72% of pull requests were merged. And again, this is only for the framework. I haven't even counted tooling and uh, material and all the other repositories where this is just for the Angular framework repository. And again, just to give you a feel for the numbers we're talking about. 2019, the picture changes slightly for the better. 77% of pull requests actually get merged, right? But again, although the numbers have slightly improved, we can certainly do better. This is another area where we can absolutely do better, right? So what can we do better? Reviewing a pull request is very, very hard, right? Because the reviewer needs to understand what the pull request is attempting to do. They need to understand and get a good handle on the approach and what's going on, what are the different pieces and how they all fit together before they can actually find meaningful flaws and make any significant, you know, like improvement suggestions, right? So basically, in the context of the conversation today, I'd like you to think about pull requests with a product management hat on. If pull requests are the product, then the reviews are the customers, right? We need to have this mentality. We want our customers or our reviewers to buy or approve the pull requests. Have we given our customers and have we made life easy for them that we would do if we are selling a product. I'd really like you to think about pull requests this way. And if we do, the world will become a better place. So the gist again is, you know, if you want to create compelling pull requests that get looked at, please you know, think about it this way, and then you know, automatically the, behavior, the, the actions will follow. What are some tangible things we can actually also do to make pull requests more compelling and actionable? Making smaller pull requests is the number one way to speed up the review time, right? Um, a smaller pull request lends itself better to incremental delivery, where we make smaller, more frequent changes as opposed to bigger, infrequent changes. Would you rather review a pull request that's self-contained with, with 100 lines of code? Would you rather review them with 5,000 lines of code, right? So there's a huge difference. The second thing is useful description and title. If pull requests are the product, the reviewers are the customers, then a useful description and title is the user guide for the product. Think about it that way, right? It helps the reviewers reason about the pull request and also understand the approach and how you've structured your changes in terms of code. Group related files into concepts and problems that are being solved. On-point commit messages. Many a time I see commit messages like, review feedback addressed. Cannot action that, right? It's not an actionable commit message. So think about commit messages and really talk about why and what has changed. That really is what you should be summarizing in one or two lines, right? Add additional comments to guide the reviewer. Um, not really explaining the code here because you're doing that in your description. Make it visual, screenshots, any other visual aids really help. Um, and last but not the least, have empathy and respect, right? Emotions are hard to convey over digital media, as we all know. And so having some empathy and appreciation for the other, what the other person does would go a long way in getting all these things taken care of. OK, so those are three strategies that I wanted to share. I also wanted to add uh, some additional information. When we release Angular code, we go through you know, different layers of quality. We have a layer of quality where we are doing our unit tests and end-to-end uh, -end tests and uh, our continuous integration and uh, our benchmarks for performance and all kinds of stuff. So we go through that for every single release and every single code change. 
Additionally, you may not realize that we also go through a whole another level of quality before we release code. And that is, we reach across thousands of Google applications and projects and actually validate this code to make sure nothing breaks. So think about it, right? You're submitting some code. You are actually validating that across a whole bunch of Google projects, thousands of them. And additionally, we also verify and sync every commit of Angular. Once it goes out to master on GitHub, it's synced back to Google. And Angular IO is also built on Angular's latest version. So these are some data points and things you can have in your back pocket. Just helps you think about stuff. OK. All right, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about contributions, for it's an amazing thing. If you think about it, a product like Angular uh, that is developed and evolved by its users has a better likelihood. I mean, these kind of products have better likelihood of actually meeting user expectations because your users are actually happen to be your developers, right? So why contribute? What are the benefits of contributing, right? You are improving the software that you use, not just for yourself, but for people around you. You're advancing your skills. You also have the opportunity to meet like-minded people. You can also find mentors, depending on the area of interest. You can find mentors, or you can actually be one. You can build and grow your reputation. And it also opens up opportunities like the collaborator program on the Angular team, which I'll talk about in just a moment, and other things as well. So there's lots of reasons, there's lots of good reasons to do it. And what it actually means to contribute, I mean, there's this opinion that contribution entails a pull request with code. And that's absolutely not true, right? There's a lot more to Angular than just code. And sometimes it is these areas that are often neglected and would really benefit from having a good contribution. And there are several ways by which you can actually contribute to Angular. You may like planning events. Uh, you may like to design, you know, uh, or Angular IO website, make improvements to it. You may like to write and do documentation work. Great contribution. You may like organizing and streamlining. Maybe you can help us with our bug triage or come up with a new process. Uh, you may like to code, it's the obvious one. You may like to help people, you know, on Gitter or Stack Overflow. That is a contribution as well. So there's so many avenues to actually make a difference. If you're a new contributor, there are some artifacts that we have. It's, it's on our repository. Highly recommend you read it. The README, the Contributing Code of Conduct, very important. Take a look at it if you're a first-time contributor. There's another area that I'd like to draw your attention to, and again with Ivy, we have enabled NGCC. NGCC is the Angular Compatibility Compiler. Basically, it processes code from NPM and produces the IV version, right? And the reason this is important is if you have a library that is compiled you know, pre iv you can take basically the node modules compiled with pre iv NGC and convert them into IV modules so your application will work with IV. So what does this mean? If you are a library author or using a project that actually uses a library, you can help us validate NGCC and find any bugs because it's still evolving. We haven't tested with every single library out there. That's just virtually impossible to do. We have tested with the most important ones and popular ones. But if you have other suggestions and libraries, please let us know. And the way you would let us know is there's actually a validation repository here. I've linked it from here. There's a directory in that repository that contains a project that uses an external library like this. Uh, with the metadata JSON generated by the pre iv NGC. If you have a library or a project, please register. The instructions are available right there. We have a continuous integration environment that runs ng build in each of those directories and validates it every day to make sure we can successfully compile it. You can go an additional step further and write unit and end-to-end -end test to actually make sure the application can run. Because we are only verifying the build and compile portion of it, you can actually verify it runs. Finding other opportunities to contribute. GitHub has enabled a couple of tags. Good first issue, name is obvious, and help wanted. These are areas where we can specifically say we need help with this particular issue. I'll admit, we don't do a good job actually using these tags and surfacing these issues, partly because everybody's been so heads down with Ivy, and now that that's released, we expect to use more and more of these. And the nice thing about these tags is they will show up on your dashboards. They'll show up on your notification system. So it's well integrated with the GitHub workflow. So stay tuned. We, I, I hope to start using more of this. All right, that wraps up the strategy and things we can do. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly, at least, is the opportunities that exist that you may or may not be aware of. 
And one is, you know, collaborate with us. So what is the collaborator program? It's actually about scaling Angular development through the community. That's really what this is all about. And if you look at the way Angular is organized today, so at the top of the pyramid, you know, we have the Googlers who are working on Angular. At the bottom of the pyramid, you have the PR contributors and issue reporters, you know, and, and uh, the entire community. The top portion of this pyramid, it's very hard to keep up with the demand the bottom portion of the pyramid is generating. And that's where the middle portion of the pyramid comes in. Those are our collaborators. And that's how we have been scaling Angular development. These are our eight amazing collaborators that um, we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and these folks have made incredible contributions in Angular. We've been fortunate to find and closely work with them. The collaborator program is not something you apply for. The collaborator program comes to you, right? And it comes to you when you make good contributions, when you do good quality work, when you help people resolve issues. So we noticed that. And then each of these people have been found that way. So it's not something they apply and you know, we review. It doesn't work like that. Additionally, I think most people are familiar. We also have the Google Developer Experts Program. Highly experienced technology experts, influencers, and thought leaders in the industry who actively support our developers, companies, and tech communities. That's what the GD program is all about. We also leverage our GDEs. Uh, we have something called the Early Access Program. So when we are developing a release, let's say a major version or something, these people really help us test and find good issues before the release is actually delivered to production. The easiest way to apply for the GD program is to actually get nominated by an existing GD. We have 119 Angular GDs worldwide. We have a huge pool of GDs today, right? We have eight GDs in India. Pune, New Delhi, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Gorakwan, Bangalore, and so on. So um, it's a very active community, and I'm really glad to see all these folks in India. All right, so let's wrap up. I think I'm almost at the end of my time. So in summary, we looked at why it's important to optimize and scale our development for the future. We also looked at specific strategies that we could use to enable us to achieve that, uh, namely writing better bug reports, creating better PRs, and also being cognizant of what you've tried. Uh, before we actually ask a question to other folks. Then we briefly talked about the contributions, and then we looked at programs that existed within Google, so for example, the Collaborators program as well as the GD program. I'm here for the rest of the day. I'm here to talk to you. Uh, if you have any constructive criticisms about Angular, feedback, anything really, please come find me, talk to me, would love to chat. Um, the slides from this talk will be posted on my Twitter account. I'll do that sometime later on today. Uh, I wanted to thank you for the opportunity. It's been great being here, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.